Hallelujah and blessings, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study in the book of Galatians. Today, we are going to begin chapter 5. And what we must keep in mind here is Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is trying to tell us the heart of the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And that is others before ourselves. You see, the debate here is between the law and the spirit. And what Paul means by this is that when we are under the law, we are so consumed within ourselves of being obedient to the law that we literally do not have, I mean, we're talking almost 700 laws. We literally do not have time to focus upon the needs of others. But when we are in the spirit, the liberty of grace, we have all the time in the world to put our attention upon others. And so that's the heart of the message. As we read chapter 5, just keep that in mind because that's why the law had to be addressed by Paul and became such an issue among these early Christians, specifically this fellowship in Galatia. So let's begin at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage or the law. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, this seemed to be one of the more important issues that the Jews were pushing upon these early Christians, specifically these Gentile Christians. He says, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit nothing. Why? Because you're putting your emphasis on you must be circumcised in order to be accepted by Christ. And Paul's saying, not so. Verse 3, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. So if you're going to follow the law in one point, you must follow the law in all points. If you're not willing to follow the law in all points, then you need to stand in grace. Verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. You no longer stand in grace. You're standing under the law. You're standing under the requirement of the obligation of fulfilling each detail of the law. And that's the opposite of grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And righteousness is in Christ Jesus. So we are waiting the return of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. That's our blessed hope. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but it is faith which works by love. Or it is faith in the person of Jesus Christ and the example he left us and he served others above all things. And so we are to do the same. He says in verse 7, You began well, you run well. Who hindered you that you would not obey the truth? For this persuasion does not come of him, Jesus, that called you. Be warned, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you allow a little bit of poison into your life, it will end up destroying you. And Paul specifically is speaking of this poison being the need to be under the obligation of the law. It will destroy the grace that you stand in. And that's why he said, you who are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Back to verse 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, that you will not even consider what these Jewish people are telling you but that you will, according to verse 1, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. For the one that troubles you will bear his own judgment, whosoever he be. You see, we are all one in Christ Jesus. He is our Lord. We are all servants to him. And none of us are above his judgment. It doesn't matter if you were one of his early disciples. It doesn't matter if you're a leader in the church. None are above the judgment of God. He says in verse 11, I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, if I preach the law, 
Why am I suffering persecution? The only reason they're persecuting me is because I am not teaching the law. If I taught what they wanted me to teach, they would be perfectly fine with what I teach. But when I oppose their very tradition, they persecute me through beatings, through imprisonment, and even trying to kill me. And so he says, if I did what they wanted me to do, the offense of the cross would, would cease. You see, the cross is offensive. The word of God is offensive. Jesus is offensive. Why? Because for lack of a better way of saying it, he attacks us at the very core of who we are. He shows us that every inclination of our heart is persistent to do what we want to do and to rebel against what he wants us to do. But the cross says, if you'll come unto me, the one who shed his blood so that your sins may be forgiven, I will give you a new desire so that you now want to do the things I want you to do, and you'll hate doing the things that you want to do. He says in verse 12, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. And so Paul is basically saying, I wish the judgment of God would rain down upon them so that they would stop troubling you. Now that he has spent five and a half chapters dealing with this issue between the law and grace, now he's going to get into the heart of what grace is truly all about. He says in verse 13, Brethren, you have been called unto liberty, but do not use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh or an occasion to sin. But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, friends, we do not need to deceive ourselves. None of us do this. If we did, at least half of everything we had would go to others. Our time, our money, our resources, our material possessions. Because we truly love ourselves, we care for ourselves, and we provide for ourselves. But we fail in loving, caring for, and providing for others the way this commandment tells us to do it. Paul says, let me give you an example in verse 15. If you bite and devour one another, if you bicker and argue with one another, take heed that you're not consumed of one another. Because these heated debates and these heated arguments divide. And as we're told through many other letters of Paul, we're to be of one mind, one doctrine, which means one teaching, there's not supposed to be all these denominations that believe all these different things. We're to be of one mind, one doctrine, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And yet how many fellowships have been split because people see things differently? Well, that's what he's warning against here. He says, I say this, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, cautiously order your life in doing the things that God wants you to do in every moment of your life, and you won't have time to fulfill the lust of the flesh because your continual focus will be upon serving others and loving God because of it and by it. He says in verse 17, the flesh lust or wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. If you do what you want to do, you're living according to the flesh. If you do what's best for others, you're living according to the Spirit. He continues in verse 18, he says, if you, if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now it's interesting, he's talking about the flesh, but he immediately identifies the law. Because the law and the flesh are very similar and have many things in common. You could almost say the law and the flesh are one. Verse 19, now these are the works of the flesh that are manifest among us. Which are these? First of all, adultery. Well, we know what adultery is. It's having sexual relations outside of the marriage bond, outside of the marriage unit. Then he mentions fornication. Well, fornication is any sexual activity for those who are not married. Then he says uncleanness, and this would lead to the idea of perversion. It may include sex with animals. It may include sex with our kin, meaning those that are very close to us, our dad, our mom, our brothers, our sisters, our close cousins, certainly homosexuality and lesbianism. 
and all the sexual sins that are listed in Leviticus chapter 18. Next, he says, lasciviousness is a work of the flesh. Well, lasciviousness is simply living life without restraint, doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, and how we want to do it, and thinking that we have to answer to no one. Then he gets into aspects of the things that we worship and we give our time and attention, our love and our adoration to. So he mentions idolatry and witchcraft, again, which needs no explanation. But some of the things that we do today, some of the things we give ourselves to or we practice and we don't realize how evil they are would be things like palm reading, fortune telling, seances, reading our horoscopes. These are all things that are against the ways of God, and we need to be very careful in how we give ourselves unto them. Even if we laugh it off and say, well, I really don't believe it. I just enjoy reading it. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that we're not even supposed to pronounce the names of false gods. Why would we allow such demonic things like these be a part of our lives? And then he gets into emotional attitudes, if you would. He mentions hatred, which simply means that you're so angry with someone that you can't even stand to be around them. Variance, which is simply division. Emulations, which is envy and rivalry and jealousy. Wrath, which is simple anger. Strife, which is arguments and debates. Seditions, which is a higher form of division, that kind of division that would split churches and fellowships that kind of division that would ruin friendships, that kind of division that would cause divorces. Next would be hearsays, which is a close kin to some of these that we've already discussed, but it's basically a dissension that rises from a differing opinion with others. And he finishes in chapter 21 with envies, murders, drunkenness, and revelings or riotings, which again are all acts of no self-control, and as spiritual children of the living God, we should exercise self-control in our lives. And so he says, I've told you these things before. I've told you them in the past that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, now that we've talked about the lust of the flesh, let's look at the fruit of the spirit because the fruit of the spirit in verse 22 is love. Well, how do you define love? sacrifice. Jesus is the greatest example of that. And by putting others before ourselves, that is a huge act of sacrifice. And so he says, the fruit of the spirit that's been born in our lives as Christians is love, first and foremost. From love comes joy. You can't have joy or any other of the following fruit unless you have love. Once you have love, which is the spirit of God himself in your life, from that love will be these extensions of joy, peace, which is the opposite of anxiety. You'll be at peace knowing that God is in control at all times and of all things. Long suffering, you'll be patient with others. Gentleness, you'll be kind to others. Goodness, you'll serve others. Faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such, There is no law for they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with all of its affections and all of its lusts if they belong to Christ. Because if we live in the spirit, verse 25, which simply means if we are made alive in the spirit, if a work of God has truly taken place in our lives, if our hearts have been exchanged, if they've been washed, if they've been made pure by the work of the Holy Spirit, let us walk or cautiously order our lives in the Spirit. And so Paul says in verse 26, if we truly understand this, let us not be desirous of vain glory. In other words, let us not be conceited. Let us not think too highly of ourselves, provoking one another. Arrogancy, pride is an ugly thing. Others can see it in us and it causes division between us. And it may even cause them to behave in unseemly ways, to think ungodly thoughts about us. And so therefore we are to give them no occasion to think such thoughts. And that's what Paul means when he says provoking one another. And let us not envy one another. 
And oftentimes the reason we do these things is because we are more focused upon ourselves receiving a pat on the back, getting attention and favor than we are upon others. I mean, if we're going to have an argument, it shouldn't be that I want to be first instead of you being first, but the argument should be reversed and it should be, I want you to be first. And the other person says, no, I want you to be first. And so we're arguing over promoting the other as opposed to trying to outdo one another. And so Paul here is simply repeating what Jesus taught, but what he is doing is he's trying to break it down so there is no question left in the mind of the reader of what is meant by love your neighbor as yourself, which Jesus himself said is the second most highest commandment that we can observe. So don't let your focus be on the 700 laws that are contained within the first covenant, the Torah specifically, the Old Testament, but let all of your attention, all of your desire, all of your focus be upon serving others, loving others, caring for others, and putting them always and at all times before yourself. Love others as you would love yourself. And if we do that, friends, our days will be so preoccupied that we will give no attention to the fleshly things the selfish things that weigh us down each and every day. Well, that's going to bring us to an end of our study today, friends. I'm so thankful that you're here today, and I pray that the Word of God is having its effect in your life and that you are truly being conformed into the man or woman of God that He has so destined you to be. Now, as He wills, and until next time, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.